Six, Foxtrot, take two. Uh, I first met Ross and Jacob uh, a little over six, seven months ago. Uh, I've been following them for a while on the internet and we always kind of just missed connections a little bit and we finally connected at NAB and uh, it was like we knew each other for years. So we met Robert in April of 2019 at NAB and he had been spying on us via Facebook for a couple of years and um, you know, writing us anonymous love notes in the mail. So, I mean, it, it was flattering, but it was kind of creepy. That was our introduction, our actual introduction to Robert. And, um, you know, we've, we've kept him a safe distance from children. You know, by the time we decided we wanted to dive into this, it was already uh, kind of a time crunch. So we started talking about ideas, and a lot of it was things that we hadn't had a chance to do. So we were looking for an excuse to try new stuff. We finally got to meet up in San Jose about three weeks ago, and that's where we really got together and figured out what exactly do we want, how are we going to make it happen. And we settled on a noir, black and white noir. I love lighting black and white. It's been so long since I've gotten to do it, and it's a challenge. It's completely different than anything else. So this is my uh, second time to Texas. The first time I was down in the Houston area where I tried the Texas staple of Whataburger and really enjoyed the Dr. Pepper milkshake, which I have not stopped thinking about for months. So the entire drive out here, I'm like, even if the film doesn't happen, I'm gonna get my Dr. Pepper milkshake. It's gonna be worth it. I have to give credit to the guy. He drove 1,200 miles by himself in a van that basically screams free candy. Turns out it's a regionalism, and the nearest Whataburger that has the Dr. Pepper milkshake is in Abilene. That's another two and a half hours away. I actually knew that Lubbock didn't have Dr. Pepper milkshakes. I didn't know that there were not Dr. Pepper milkshakes in Lubbock. I, I had no clue. So day one was setup day. Uh, we were able to get into the location. We get here and the original idea was to get set up and then start shooting Friday night. And then it's getting closer and closer. And I'm going, we haven't even had time to run through everything with our talent yet. So I talked to Robert. Yeah, I was like, how would you feel about instead of us rolling tonight, let's just rehearse, you know, get things down, let our talent get used to each other. So we decided to postpone shooting a Saturday and you know, just run through everything on Friday night. And eventually, you know, through the rehearsal and the blocking, we work all of these issues out. And in the process, more jokes actually become a part of the film. So one of the things that I loved about this competition is the challenge of it. And taking one location and trying to make it look like something completely different or multiple things. And one of the challenges we had was, how do we make a gymnasium look like a 1940s detective's office. Um, and I really tried to take a lot of inspiration from those old Clark Gable movies and find a way to use the lighting to create texture on the walls and to, to uh, have separation between them in a way that was interesting in black and white. So for the office scene, uh, we were able to use the new Aperture Lantern to try to give us a really nice soft pool on our dame and have her look really luxurious. Um, and then we used another 120D to edge the detective. So he's just got a little bit of fill and then he's got a really hard light coming from this window. Problem is, we don't have a window in that room. So to make it feel as if there's a light source really far away coming back, what we actually did is we took a mirror and put it next to where the window needs to be and back to 120D off with some barn doors and just hit that mirror and reflect it back so it feels like it's three times as far away as it actually was. And then we used some, some tape to go ahead and give it some texture. And uh, it really feels like there's a window there and we put a light on the other side of that wall. One of the things about our dame is we wanted her to feel really mysterious and there's a lot of allure and you want to see her because she's just shrouded in this silhouette. Uh, and to achieve that, we used a, an eight by Matthews voodoo cloth in a frame with an Aperture 300D blasting into it. So we kind of almost have this halo-y glow wrapping around her, but there's no detail on her face. And then we used uh, that same 120D with a gel frame uh, and some tape on it to give us a window texture on the wall next to her so you can tell that it's not just pure black, but she's just gone. One of the classic noir gags is having that one completely unmotivated slash of light on the eyes. Uh, and that was a really a fun effect to do. Super simple, we just took a sheet of black wrap, cut a hole in it, 
strapped it onto a stand and blasted that light through it. And it's one of those things that's so easy to do, but we never do that stuff anymore. And I think that the impact that we got from it was really effective. So one of the scenes, we have our two actors in a car. We actually took a back seat of a car and did, there's like, you know, a process trailer, and then there's like the poor man's process, and then there's like what we did. So we used three Aperture 120D Mark IIs on the television setting at different frequencies from the sides and the front with a light dome to just kind of give it the feeling that lights are moving. And then we did uh, a gag with some four bys and cut the shape of a windshield and Jacob's operating a 300D whipping by to look like a car passing with a, an intensity ramp and everything. And it, it actually looked pretty good. When it comes to comedy, there's a level of complication that's just going to be inherent. Um, first, big gag we had in the bar scene was, you know, we have our dame, she's she's a social smoker. And, you know, our, our man comes in, sits down, orders her a drink, a cigarette manifests, and she puts it up to her mouth, and our man's like, here, let me light that for you. Well, where does a cigarette come from? We got the idea of, well, let's get Jacob and Dansby, and maybe Ian, let's put a cigarette in each one of their hands and put them all in at the same time. Once we got that nailed down, then came the, the next gag where she's gonna take, take a long drag off the cigarette and blow the smoke into Ian's face. And what better way to do that than with a fog machine? The tube of justice got introduced. So we had to rig a piece of Robert's speed rail to the fog machine and place it where Eve's mouth was gonna be so that when she, you know, blows out the smoke, it looks like it's coming out of her mouth. We launched the fog through the tube and it just goes everywhere. Robert's taping it up, uh, and every time he puts on a piece of tape, fog starts coming out of another hole somewhere in the wrong direction. Robert fought the fog, and the fog won. But in the end, we figured out that uh, Robert had a first aid kit in his car. We got one of the rubber gloves out of it, got it on, cinched it on, taped it up, and that gave us our perfect stream of fog. Dansby let us borrow an old rotary phone that he just had lying around for our phone booth scene. The more practical elements we could have in our VFX scenes, the better off we were going to be. This scene is also where we placed accent, the keyword for this competition. Our records indicate that your warranty has lapsed and it is our duty to annoy the hell out of you until- I had a hard time understanding their accent, but that was about it. Most certain death. Oh, and I don't have a car. One of the funniest gags in this film is the phone booth scene where she asks him to walk him home. And they're basically already there. Um, and that presented a lot more challenges than it, it might seem because there has to be enough motion that you feel that they're walking, but also so little that you really get the sense of, oh, we didn't go anywhere, okay. And uh, that took a lot of time. Uh, Ross and I had to sit down and, and really kind of draw it out and diagram it to make sure that that joke would land. And uh, once we got it set up, we used our Dana Dolly to track or to grab alongside them and when that moment happens and she starts to walk and then immediately stops and turns to him and says that we're here, it's, it was so hard to not break every single time. Yeah, I couldn't be happier with the crew. I couldn't be happier with the cast. Um, and I couldn't be happier that Robert's leaving tomorrow because if I hear about a Dr. Pepper milkshake being in Abilene one more time, I'm gonna lose my sh I think it's always a really good sign when at the end of three back-to-back 18-hour -back days, you're still laughing. You're still enjoying each other's company. There's a whole bunch of little inside jokes and things and nobody's frustrated. And we probably could have gone home half an hour early every day, but we just wanted to spend time with each other. And it, that was something that doesn't happen often. Uh, and was particularly special about this film. I'm really happy with how everything's turned out. It's been a phenomenal experience so far.